All right, well, coming on the back of yesterday's news about Intel Arc GPUs, well, I mean, the laptops that they're supposed to be in because we're not even near the desktop GPUs yet, like not really coming out, except then they backed up and said, wait a minute, they're actually out in Korea on this like one particular laptop. If so, if you happen to buy that one. Well, now we've actually got some information that, well, some people in Korea did buy that laptop, although reportedly not many, but some of them were actually reviewers. And so now there are some actual reviews, full reviews, of an ARC A350M laptop. This is specifically the Samsung, Samsung Galaxy Book 2 Pro, which again, seems to be like the only actual laptop out there with an ARC GPU in it. <laughs> and you have to be in the South Korean market to even get one. Anyway, so, because these reviews, I believe, are, um, you know, not in a language I understand, I am going to be using the video cards article here to kind of summarize some of that info. So this is not video cards own review, but this is their reporting on some of the information from these reviews. And guys, I've got some concerns. The first thing that I want to bring up is it sounds like there is some serious driver issues, and I wouldn't even be surprised if this is the reason why ARC is so delayed compared to when we initially thought we would get it. And then not only that, but even though it's officially out now, we're barely seeing of the, any of them. For example, in the actual Intel graphics control panel, it can't identify its own GPU. It lists it as unknown 5694. That's not off to a great start, guys. <laughs> also, they're reporting that this could be a confusing update for, for users because the update that has the Arc GPU branch is apparently not the newest branch. So, so there's different branches of the GPU drivers and um, you have to make sure you get the right one with the ARC support, and yeah, that not being the newest one could confuse people. That's just not a great start. Also, they mentioned down towards the end of this article that there were certain games like COD Cold War and Forza Horizon 5, I believe it was, that just wouldn't launch and play at all. Just didn't work. Okay, now what are the actual specs of this laptop that they're testing? So this model that they have has a core i5 1240p. That's an Alder Lake 12 core with 16 threads, right? 12 core with 16 threads because of the whole Alder Lake, you got some of your you know performance cores that have hyper threading and your efficiency cores that don't. Um, we've got 16 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM. It's a 1080p 60 Hertz AMOLED display. And so that's another reason why I think a lot of people aren't buying this particular model. It's priced rather high, but only has a 1080p 60 Hertz display. So, I mean, and this being the lowest of the uh, Arc GPUs, maybe this really isn't target. I mean, this is like an ultra thin thing. So this isn't really a gaming laptop. I think the idea here would be that you'd be using this as a GPU in some kind of a, you know, more of a, a workload, not a gaming workload, uh, would be my thought on where this is targeted. Remember, this is the Arc A350M, which is the lowest end model. It has four gigabytes of RAM. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look. So they did run some synthetic benchmarks, and I've got some issues with what they chose to put this up against, because when it comes to mobile graphics chips, the number one most important thing is the performance per watt. You want to be comparing GPUs that draw the same amount of power. That's what you want to do. And that's not quite what they did. Although the uh, MX450 is at 25 watts, so that's a pretty fair comparison. They put it up against the GTX 1650 50 watt mobile version. To my knowledge, and I believe they say in this article as well, I think there are some Max-Q variants of the 1650 that draw 30 or 35 watts, which would have been much more reasonable to compare it against. Now, with that being said, we are seeing the ARC 350M, I think, putting up decent numbers against these GPUs, with it beating the 25-watt MX450, 
and with it losing to the 50 watt 1650, which makes sense. But it's not, you know, such a horrible difference given that power draw difference that actually that looks like a pretty reasonable score, although it's, you know, not like the 1650 is just the, you know, brand new, absolutely just launched cutting edge thing like the 350M is. <laughs> anyway, um, well, brand new cutting edge question mark. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, in Firestrike, we see, you know, the, the same sort of spread. I mean, they're, they're kind of spread a bit differently on the higher score numbers, but still, you know, follow it, falling in between those same D, uh, two GPUs. But these are synthetic benchmarks. And synthetic benchmarks absolutely do not always tell you everything about the gaming performance of a GPU. But wait, how about the biggest win against those GPUs? it can actually produce a Port Royal result, meaning it actually has ray tracing support. So one of the nice things with the 350M is it does have ray tracing support, it has XCSS support, whenever XCSS actually, you know, is a thing. <laughs> anyway, it only got a score of 200 in Port Royal. So honestly, guys, the ray tracing support on lower end GPUs is just, in my opinion, pointless. I don't know if there's some production task where it could, could be helpful, but there's just no way I would be enabling ray tracing on a GPU that's gonna be getting these types of frame rates with it running. But hey, that is technically a win over GPUs that don't have ray tracing support, so there you go. Now, again, along with the driver issues, when we get to the gaming benchmarks, Okay, it's producing decent frame rates at 1080p, but look at the GPU usage, okay? So we got a whole bunch of games here. Um, I don't know if they list all of them, but they're generally kind of some esports type titles. We're seeing League of Legends, Overwatch, that kind of stuff, uh, PUBG. So they're reporting lots of stutters. The core frequency staying at 2.2 gigahertz and the GPU usage staying low. This, I, and I think the exact settings they use in the games aren't available, at least here in this, this video cards article. They're speculating at low, just judging by what it looks like, I believe. Um, anyway, and that, that would be fair to test. On, on this caliber of GPU, I would imagine they're turning settings way down. Uh, but it, they are saying 1080p resolution, which you know is, is actually pretty nice, because sometimes on a, on a low-end mobile chip, you would even go below 1080p. Anyway, so hey, 100 FPS, great. The GPU usage only sitting at 70%. And this frame time graph does have a lot of spikes in it. There's lots of spikes in those frame time graphs. Let me get my fat head out of the way. Ah! Okay, anyway. <laughs> but look, at that. that's like pretty consistent in, in all of these that we're seeing, you know, 58.5% GPU usage, 59.3% GPU usage, 39.1% GPU usage. Um, yeah, 65.3, 45.6, 70.2. As long as you're not CPU limited, you're, you should be GPU limited by fully utilizing that GPU. And I don't think that at these frame rates, a newer Alder Lake chip, even a mobile one, should have been the limit. I mean, the CPU usage, CPU usage can be a little misleading. So it would be nice to see this per core because I would like to see if somehow there was a core of the CPU maxed out, but this is happening in all of these games. It really feels like to me that something's wrong with it, the drivers being able to fully utilize the GPU. And again, I think that this would completely line up with Intel struggling with their graphics drivers and that being the reason why we didn't get these actually in quarter one and why I think it's still gonna be a while before we get these because I think that they are going to want to have their graphics drivers, you know, ironed out a lot better than this before their discrete desktop GPUs launch. And maybe the this kind of limited laptop launch could be a, uh, you know, trial run <laughs> and try to get things better. And again, here's where they mentioned that, yeah, it was Forza Horizon 5 and COD Cold War would not even work at all. Anyway, there is a lot more information in these reviews and there are some more reviews out as well that they link down here at the bottom. And I will link this article in the description of my video so you can take a closer look. Now, before we go today, let's talk about a couple other stories. 
So we've got uh, some rumors. This is Graymon55 again, I believe, who is a uh, well-known and, and leaker who tends to have a pretty good track record of getting things right that the 5 nanometer Zen 4 CPUs, these are the Ryzen 7000 chips, codenamed Raphael, should be entering mass production this month. Now, that doesn't mean that we should expect to get them next month on sale. That usually means that we're four to four to five months out, which would put us out towards the end of this year, but maybe even as soon as September or October. But it certainly could still be later than that. And remember, we're gonna need new motherboards for these. So since we'll need AM5 motherboards, I think we also need to wait for motherboards to be ready to launch as well. So we'll see. Anyway, the actual tweet was a painter. We'll go into mass production later this month. A painter? Who's the painter? Raphael. Anyway. Uh, let's go with one other interesting thing here. So this, I'm getting from WCCF Tech, but they're reporting from Moore's Law is Dead, YouTube channel, where he get, went into a lot of detail on what he's seeing from his sources with various confidence levels on what we should expect from the RX 7700 XT. This would be the Navi 33 GPU die, according to him. So there should also be a higher end 32 and an even higher end 31 uh, die. This would be on the six nanometer process. And he's seeing, thinking that it'll only have eight gigabytes, which compared to the 6700 XT from the, our current generation, that's a downgrade because we have a 12 gigabyte uh, memory uh, configuration on the 6700 XT. So that's interesting. Now, performance-wise, other than that, as long as you're not running out of VRAM, he's thinking it should match a 6900 XT in rasterization, but beat it in ray tracing due to AMD, you know, getting better ray tracing design on these new chips. And he's thinking it'll be around 200 watts of power draw and be more efficient than Lovelace. Okay, now again, this is from, you know, Moore's Law is dead. This is, this is leaks. This is not official information from AMD. So don't, don't take these as this is exactly how it will be. Also, if we go to his actual slide, he color codes things. Ah! Anyway, <laughs> so he color codes things. So things that he's color coded as red are things he has very high confidence in, which I think means that he has probably got multiple sources or it just makes a lot of sense for him. Uh, to believe those, right? The things that he's colored in, what is this? Is this salmon? salmon? I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> that color, the, the pinkish, uh, I'll call it salmon. Uh, that's high confidence, but not widespread info. And then white is mostly confident. So I'm interested in the eight gigabytes of memory because to me, uh, that, that is a downgrade, especially something with 6,900 XT level of performance and with better ray tracing, and using ray tracing usually increases your VRAM usage. Eight gigabytes on a card that should be capable of decent 4K gaming and really good 1440p gaming and ultra wide 1440p. Uh, that's, but he's got that in red. He's got that as very high confidence. Now again, he could be wrong, but he's got that listed as very high confidence. I'm interested in that. Now he also clarifies the 6900 XT rasterized performance when I mentioned 4K. So he's saying that it's probably going to be about the same in 1440p, but actually be a bit weaker in 4K and a bit better in 1080p. So that is a little bit interesting. I wonder if that's due to the infinity cache. Let's see. So he's saying that it should be, but this is not one of his more confident statements. It's the high confidence, not very, very high confidence <laughs> um, of 128 megabytes of infinity cache. But he still thinks that, you know, it, it could go to 256, but he just thinks that doesn't make sense on this lower end, uh, lower mid-range die, which is what he's calling it. He's also got the die size pegged. Um, which would be uh, a lot smaller than the 6900 XT die. But I mean, that's partially due to the die shrink down to the, the six nanometer or whatever it is. Anyway, so I don't know, this is all pretty interesting, but as we all know, all of these early leaks and rumors can certainly be wrong. What's the cost? Now, again, this is not one of his red, like very high confidence, but he's thinking between four to $500. 
And I mean, honestly, that would make sense for a 60, uh, sorry, 7,700, right? The 700 class coming in around $500 would, would make more sense to me. That's, you know, the, the 6,700 XT was 479. And personally, I wouldn't expect MSRPs to be lower on the next gen. I would expect them to be the same or higher. So I think 500 sounds a lot more, not necessarily what I want, but what I think might be more in line with reality. Um, anyway, now remember this, this he is thinking is a, is still a monolithic die where, which means like it's one die. Whereas we're, we're seeing the, the, all the leaks pointing towards the higher end chips, possibly being a multi-chip module design. And I'm really interested in how that plays out. And I really hope that they've completely solved any kind of weird latency issues or anything that could come along with that. All right, this video is getting fairly long, so I think we'll go ahead and uh, end it there. I gotta wake up my kids, and, and we're gonna go. We're gonna go see the elephants. Anyway, <laughs> I hope you guys have an excellent day.